We will now hand over the dialogue session to Mr. Zainuddin, who will chair the panel. Mr. Zainuddin, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I know this has been a long day, but I'm so happy to see everyone here. Um, we are very honored to have Mr. Uh, Mr. Benjamin Lynch here with us today. Please give him a round of applause. And of course, you have heard Dr. Matthew Matthews earlier this morning when he presented the research. And let me introduce Mr. Neil Humphreys. I like his articles in the newspaper. I, every, time, every time when I reach, read his article, I will laugh um, the, and make my day all, all the time. So he likes to write about Singapore. And in his own way, he has experienced a unique uh, life uh, and I think worthwhile for us to hear from him too. So today I'm just going to open this uh, discussion by allowing each one of um, the panelists to say a few words. Then subsequently we will open it to the floor. And when it's open to the floor, please introduce yourself and ask, if possible, only one question or share your experience. Okay? So maybe. I would like to invite Minister to say a few words uh, as an opening before we start the discussion. Well, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, maybe what I'll do is just share some thoughts um, that you might want to consider. Um, at the end of it, I think, you know, for all of us here, uh, we all individually have to decide what is the kind of Singapore we want to build. It's not something that government tells you, this is what it should be, it's not what because ultimately, the things that are shared are very individual in many ways. Some are perspectives which we also share. But individuals must make that choice. And that's something I always felt quite strongly about, especially... I've always felt that way, uh, increasingly, having entered politics and meeting many people. One of the things that we all need to pay attention to is our personal responsibility in making choices. Oftentimes, we talk as if it's you know, schools should do this, our parents should do that, and definitely it's government's fault and the government should be doing this. But we seldom ask about, actually, what can we do in our own space, in our own personal capacity? And today, I ask you to look at your own experience, meeting people from different backgrounds, um, sometimes for the first time, for some of you, uh, listening to them, connecting with them, and realising the kind of relationships that you can establish in the course of a few hours and how that changed like the last group was sharing about how when you first entered the room people were strangers and you leave the room perhaps not quite as friends but certainly people who you can be friends with but those are things that are well within your control things that you can do what you say how you act how you treat others in your day-to-day -day lives the people that you meet in school the people you meet at work well, okay, you're not working, huh? but the people that live around you, the way you communicate in person, the way you communicate online, the way you comment, all these things shape the kind of society we want to build. And all this is within your control. So what I just want to live with you really is that I think all of us have a part to play. I think many of you say that. And I think it's not just a big idea, but actually it starts from the very little things. And if all of us here feel so committed about these things, as do many Singaporeans. And they actually walk the talk and actually act out and live the life that they seem to proclaim. Surely society will change. And surely, I think the question is, and I always look at it that way, that we might be a little red dot, as you know, some people say, but I think we have a big heart and I think we can build a great nation. And what is this great nation? I think it's about the people and our capacity to care and love others. And I think that's something that we can really build here. But that can only happen when all of us here actually do something about it. So that's, that's probably what I would like to share with you as a starting remark. But thank you very much for all your sharing and certainly for participation. And I look forward to your questions and sharing as well. Thank you very much. This morning, you have heard Dr. Matthew. So, but, but now I think I'll give Neil a chance to, to say his piece as an opening. Sure, yes. Uh, apologies, I'm a little bit jet-lagged. I only replied, I only arrived back yesterday, so if I talk even more cock than usual, I apologise right away. Um, 
But the US trip was very relevant to me and very relevant to this discussion. I've been in the US for one month and I arrived back, as I say, yesterday. Three topics of conversation kept coming up while I was in the US. When I said I lived in Singapore, the first thing Americans asked me or wanted to talk about was chewing gum. Americans are still obsessed with chewing gum in Singapore. It's been 20 years and all they want to talk about is the ban of chewing gum. It's like, get over it, move on already, it's done, come on. The second thing they wanted to talk to me about, because I'm British, was the royal family and the baby. All they kept saying to me was, when is the baby due? When is the baby due? I'm not the father of the baby. I've got no idea. Why do you keep asking me this? We share a passport. That's all we share. I've got nothing to do with the royal family whatsoever. And the final thing was, and I'm not making this up, the final thing was, when I say I'm from Singapore, or I live in Singapore, They genuinely asked me, how do you do it? How does Singapore do it? And you should be so damn proud. I'm proud, and I'm an Angmore, to live in this country. Because they asked me this time and time again. And I'll just briefly explain why. It's a bit of a dark subject. But while I was there, and do read up on it, there was a very, very controversial case Uh, an American teenage boy was killed. Did you hear about this? A black American, uh, African American boy was killed by a Hispanic man who was a neighborhood watch guy. The teenager was unarmed. The guy had a gun. And all kinds of stereotypes and prejudice came out. He saw an unarmed, hooded, black teenager, felt threatened. They had an argument. He shot him. No, and he died. While I was there, the case was going on, and the guy was eventually found not guilty. Why this is relevant is because it triggered, again, in the US, unprecedented debate about where they stand on race in America. And I'll be honest with you, I was utterly shocked. In my naivety, I thought an African-American president had changed things in the US. It hasn't. It hasn't. Racial tensions constantly simmer beneath the, te- uh, beneath, the searches, uh, beneath the surface in the US. A black taxi driver told me an unbelievable anecdote that you need to remember. He said, there are certain white neighborhoods in the US that I won't drive my taxi after dark. White neighborhoods, not poor neighborhoods, affluent, middle-class, white neighborhoods. Him and his black colleagues will not drive their taxis there after dark. Because if they reverse their car to to pull away, if they reverse their car into someone's driveway, they fear that there is a chance they could get shot. Because the white family will see a black man reversing their car into the driveway and they may panic and do something stupid. I'm not making it up. Those are his exact words. So there is real racial, deep racial tension, even now in the U.S., that we are blessed, blessed in this country not to have. And we should never, ever, I don't want to sound like the government now, but we should never, ever take it for granted, really. It is something to be proud of and it is something to cherish. And I'll finally say something that is completely coincidental but very relevant. When I was in the Disney store, my wife going nuts buying Mickey Mouse stuff, when I was in the Disney store, I came across a, a young girl working in a Disney store. And you're not going to believe this, but this is true. Straight away, I recognized her accent. She had a singlish accent. I said, are you Singaporean? And she said, yes, I go to Singapore Polytechnic. And apparently, you have this wonderful course that I don't know too much about, where a number of students go to the US and work for Disney to learn about retail, marketing, management, PR. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And within seconds, we were sharing we were talking about roll jug and pasta malams and how everything was so expensive in the US, you know? <laughs> Straight away, how our race was completely irrelevant. I didn't think of her as Chinese. She didn't think of me as tall, lanky, angmore. She just, we were Singaporeans talking about expensive, talking about American, talking about roll jug, chicken rice, hor fun, ch- uh, uh, char kway tiao, you name it. We had a shared a connection because we were essentially Singaporean. Our race, colour, creed was completely irrelevant. Never take that for granted. It is a wonderful thing to have in this country and you should be so, 
so damn proud to have it. And I, as an Angmore and a foreigner, am honoured and privileged and proud to live in such a wonderful, multiracial country. Thank you. So, Dr. Matthews? Thank you. Neil just shared about how other people look at Singapore and where I am at the Institute of Policy Studies, we have many people from around the world who come to find out a little bit about the secret of Singapore's multiracial, uh, multi-religious kind of harmony. Everybody around the world looks at us as being, doing this thing very successfully. We do a lot of things successfully, but this is one thing that it's, I mean, people celebrate quite a bit. Uh, but here in Singapore, among us, we kind of think about, it's not just ensuring that there's no fighting, no riots because of race. We want to go one step higher. That's what uh, seemed to come out from the poll that you all did. It's very clear that many of you, about half of you, said that what's most important about racial harmony is about uh, no stereotypes, dealing with people without stereotypes. And that is something which, you know, it's a, it goes beyond the normal level which most people have, which is let's have no, let's have no fighting, let's have tolerance for other people. It's about wanting to remove stereotypes. That is a difficult thing. Uh, we have lots of, I mean, from day one, we develop stereotypes as part of how our brain processes thing, things and we begin to put people into boxes. But it is great when people say that we are done with stereotyping people. And rather than that, we want to look at people apart from the lens of colour, but look at what they really are and interact with them without having to go through this lens where it says, well, this person's Malay, he's like this, if he's Chinese, he's like this, but go beyond that. For that to happen though, it's going to take all of us, not just knowing about the other, but also in our own little groups, defending people who are from other kinds of ethnic group or racial backgrounds or other religions. Very commonly, I mean, when we have friends, most of our friends tend to be fairly similar to ourselves. And in those clusters, I mean, there will be someone who has had a bad experience. Someone met somebody who is from another racial group or another religious group, maybe another nationality, and immediately uh, they begin bad experience and then they say, you know what, all these people are like that. They're terrible people. And it is a chance for us then to be ambassadors for racial harmony and to stop and say, you know what, maybe that was one person, but maybe that's not all about everybody in that particular racial group. I think we all can mature to do that by being the ones who kind of send that message and say, you know what, let's rethink about this. Just because you had a bad experience with one person who was, or a few people from a particular group, does not mean that all of them are like that. Wonderful. So now, it's up to you. We are here for you. We would like to hear from you. Questions, sharing, whatever it may be. So you have two ways, the pigeonhole, SMS or the third one is coming to the mics that you have here. Just introduce yourself and one question or sharing one experience, please. The first one. Don't be shy. Come on. If the first one is difficult, then the second one then. <laughs> ah, young lady, please, give a round of applause. Well done, well done. Yes, the mic is on. Uh, I'll answer that because, um, as many of you know, I am also a, a humour columnist and I've written many books about Singapore. And for the longest time, um, I, always had two, I always had an overriding sort of philosophy. I never wrote about race and I never wrote about religion. No one ever told me. There was no government conspiracy or anything like that. It was just a personal choice. Uh, I chose not to do it. It's a can of worms I didn't feel I wanted to open. However, in recent times, I have changed my mind a little bit. I 
don't mock race or religion per se, of course not, but I do mock intolerance because intolerance should be shown up for what it is, ignorant, stupid, daft. And if I can get people to laugh at that intolerance, then they might ask deeper questions. I'll give you a couple of examples very briefly. Um, recent, about a year ago, I was in uh, Northbridge Road. <laughs> Without going into too much details, I was guilty of jaywalking. Please don't arrest me on the panel. But uh, I was guilty of jaywalking. I was in hurry for an appointment. It was my fault, I'll admit that. I was holding my daughter at the time, and a very irate guy stopped in his car and shouted, damn you white trash, at me. Which I was weird because, you know, in, in 12 years, honestly, truthfully, uh, I'd never experienced any racism of any kind before. And, you know, and the white trash thing, you know, I've never owned a, I've never lived in a trailer park, I've never played the banjo, I don't, I don't chew straw. I've never lived in the deep south. You know, I had no idea what he was talking about, frankly. <laughs> but, but I wrote a column about it, talking about some of those things, making the audience laugh. Because you hope that if they laugh, when the laughter stops, they take away certain mes messages. If you show it up to be the idiotic comment that it is, let's be honest, and by making people laugh, then hopefully they go away and think about it a little bit deeper. So in my personal experience, I think humour can be a very useful tool for getting at some very sensitive issues. So yes, I do tackle the subject. That doesn't mean I make racial jokes, but I do make fun of racism because it's idiotic. And if I can make people think about the idiocy of racism and intolerance through humour, then I think there can be a positive outcome from that. Maybe I'll just say that um, I think, you know, I, I don't think it's just about racial or religious jokes. I think jokes generally that we make, whether of people with, I mean, you all know that there are all sorts of jokes out there, people with disabilities, people who are different. We are all guilty of that at some point. And, I, and, and to admit it, I mean, some of us would find, and there are quite funny jokes out there. But the, the, the challenge is this. I think we do live, and the thing about jokes is that there's a very sharp edge to jokes. Um, there's a very dark element to it. We laugh at it, but we sometimes don't understand how people alongside us might respond to it. And that's where I think we do need to pay attention to these things. Innocuous jokes, statements that we make, that we think it's actually harmless, uh, especially today with social media, a lot of things are being shared. The more you do it, and the more we seem to say, oh, let's be more tolerant, let's be more matured. After all, we have arrived as a nation, we are such a racially tolerant society. We should be matured enough to accept this. And then let's not be too particular over these things. Slowly, I think we are also taking it for granted. And I think slowly you are also desensitizing people to some of these things. Because you begin to think that it's okay to accept it. And it's actually quite cool or, you know, we are more enlightened, we are not so, um, so sensitive about it. But I actually believe that why we pay attention to racial harmony, religious harmony, and actually in Singapore, I think just dealing with differences is because we treasure it. Not because we lack confidence in our people, in being matured, in being big-minded. I think it's because we believe that, I mean, as Neil shared, I mean, and those of you who have traveled, I've lived abroad for many years, actually in the UK as well, and training abroad, and I've had my fair share of encounters with people, and not jaywalking, um, but running, and funnily, it's always running. They've encountered in Christchurch, in New Zealand, in the States, uh, in UK as well, just running, and people just drive by and they shout at you and just call you names. But I think that's, we, we pay attention and we pay particular, a lot of effort in this because we think it's important. Because human nature is such that you, know, you scratch the surface, the race and religious aspect is there. It's no point pretending that it doesn't exist. I think we just have to acknowledge that, and there's nothing wrong with that. We should be proud of our own heritage. We should be proud of, proud of our own culture. But that doesn't preclude us from actually also establishing shared perspectives with others. So I think that's really important that the question you raised isn't just about jokes, but I think the way we converse. And I think we do need to pay attention to that, particularly in this realm. And especially in a context where a lot of young people today are online, are not always necessarily guided. And they are just absorbing some of these things. And you see some of this hate that's being thrown around. Less on race and religion today, there's a bit of that, but a lot of nationality. 
And I'm a bit worried as a Singaporean because I don't think that's what, who we are. I don't think that's who you are. But by keeping quiet, by letting this pass, we are slowly ceding that space to these people who are bringing us down to a very low common denominator, which is where I don't think we belong as a society. Can I just add to that very briefly? Um, in, the, in, in the talk of the recent talk about the curry pot wars and, and, and all those other incidents that involve predominantly, uh, not always, but predominantly mainland Chinese residents, I became, as a foreigner myself, I became very concerned that the legitimate discourse, legitimate debate, I felt was being hijacked online by people with very sinister agendas, racists. And I experienced this in the UK growing up. Now, I'm very, I'm very aware of the fact that when I grew up in the UK, I was essentially part of the majority race. I was white. So you do take it for granted. You do. It's, it's human nature that you are the majority race and you don't think how a minority might think. It's only when I moved overseas that my view started to change. But that also happens in the UK. In er, whenever there's a time of a socioeconomic downturn, recession, whatever, there is a, there's a knee-jerk reaction to pick on the foreigner. And that has happened in the last couple of years or so online in Singapore. And it does concern me because I do think that legitimate concerns about housing costs and salary, and salary demands and so on and so on are being hijacked by a very small, very small, I might add, minority of people who do have a more sinister agenda. And I think it's absolutely critical, I really do, having grown up in a country where there is a degree of racism, that organisations like One People, G, and like yourselves say, no, this isn't right. And silence is not enough. I think these people have to be outed. I think these people have to be challenged. I think these people can't make throwaway comments on Facebook and Twitter and just think it's freedom of speech and hide behind this big banner called freedom of speech. They should be accountable like everybody else. And it's up to you guys. It's not up to us. It's up to you guys to stand up and say, you know what, you are wrong. And this is why I think you are wrong. Great. There's a issue of sensitivity and for us to be able to also individually take responsibility of what we say, even if it's a joke, sometimes we must be able to understand our surrounding and who we are addressing those things. Okay, next one, please. Yes, young man. Uh, in a country like, uh, ah, can you introduce yourself first? Uh, I'm Michelle from uh, NPS International. Okay. Um, so in a country like South Africa, where the majority in majority cases uh, has a darker skin tone, mm. how come racism, uh, racial uh, uh, discrimination is even more over there? Like, because the majority of cases has a darker skin tone, but they are still being made fun of. Um, you're referring to South Africa? Yeah. You're asking a question or you're sharing your views? No, I'm asking you a question. Oh, wow. <laughs> Why? A country like South Africa, even you have majority of the uh, Africans, uh, the citizens, and yet the, they are still be being made fun of. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Matthew? Yeah, just a quick answer for that. I mean, that also goes with who has power. And uh, in that country, those who have, I mean, who have lighter skin tend to have more money and more resources, and then they tend to put out other people who don't have those resources. I think in the long run, I think in every country we think about, there's always a group of people who have more. And when the group who has more resources tend to congregate in a particular group, whether it's race, whether it's religion, whether it's country of origin, then it becomes, and if they are not careful and they use that position to dominate over others, then there's going to be that kind of tension. Maybe I've just to build on that and, and just amplify this is that stereotypes which we talk about, I think all of us have that. It's not just race, it's not just religion, it is also economic background, it's also schools, education levels, jobs. I think all of us as human beings, we have a tendency to look at people through stereotypes because it's easy to put people in pigeonholes and boxes. Well, actually, the only people you should put in boxes are people who are dead. Now, but, <laughs> but, the, but I think the, the point is, we all do that. Our parents do that. And we, we see people doing it. We see the throwaway comments. 
And I think if you pay attention to the way you respond to others and the way you act, for example, remember how you felt like this morning when you first got into the room and you met students and young people who came from other backgrounds, different schools, maybe different races, international students, local students. Did you have certain impressions that you thought, well, you know, this guy, that girl, what? I think all of us have that. And I think what you're reflecting in South Africa is probably not unique to South Africa. It's, unique, it's something that happens in every country. I think in every country that we live in, every country we work in, there will be elements of that. So, key thing is, let's not pretend that we are colorblind. Let's not pretend that race, religion, differences doesn't exist. They are there. It's, but embrace it. And I think to be conscious of it, it's the first step, I think, into creating something that's common and that's something that's very precious for all of us. I think that the stereotype thing is, is, is absolutely key. I think you find that in every country on earth. You know, Singapore's not unique, South Africa's not unique. Look, when I first arrived in Singapore, <laughs> people see the white face, wow, I'm more, I've got a lot of money here. Well, I, I don't. <laughs> And I used to say I was going to go to Orchard Road and wear a big sign. No condo, no, no rich expat package. I'm not rich, leave me alone. You know, because I would go to these places and the ladies would come up, well, I'm more, buy me a drink, huh? But uh, I don't have any money. Please leave me alone. So stereotypes are everywhere. Positive, negative, they are everywhere. And the parent thing is so critical, the point that was just made. Here's a revelation. I grew up in a household that was racist. I grew up in a very typical blue-collar, working-class British uh, household that was predominantly racist. And it would be very hard to say in many places, and now I'm generalizing, but I would argue that in many places around the world, in, in very deeply entrenched working-class, what you might call heartland communities, it's, some, it's very hard sometimes to avoid racism at some level. Anyone who says otherwise, I think, is a liar or grew up with Mother Teresa, and I don't think that's possible. So, everyone in this room would have experienced or overheard some level of racism at some point in their life, in their own house. So, it's how you deal with it. It's how you take responsibility. And to tie in with that South Africa point and bring it full circle, what's the difference between our generation, the previous generation, the one before that, and the one before that? You would hope it would be education, and therefore, a certain level of enlightenment. That's the way out. That's the way out of stereotypes, racism, and so on. Emancipation through education hopefully brings enlightenment. Not always, but that's what you hope. So this is where, you, again, you have to take responsibility for yourselves. It doesn't matter what you hear your aunties and uncles and grandparents say. You're educated. We're part of the online generation. We're a global generation now. We're aware of what's around us. It's up for us to step up to the plate and say, you know what? You might be my mum, my dad, my auntie, my uncle, my grandparents, filial piety, I respect you, I love you, but I can't agree with that. And that's where you take the responsibility for yourself. And, and if I can just ask you to consider, I think many of you here would have foreign domestic workers at home. Mm. Think about how you, are, how you look at them, yep, absolutely. how you are treating them. In fact, sometimes a bit worrying is how are your parents treating them? And the people who provide services, who work, the construction workers and all that. Think about it and the way we respond and the way we act. I think there's some insights to be gained from that. It's not just about us fellow Singaporeans. It's the way we look at people. Absolutely. So something to be aware of. Absolutely. Good point. So everyone has responsibility. That's why today's topic, next gen, right? Generation next, the future of harmony, you are the one. We want you to start to feel responsible for these things, and we are here to discuss. Thank you very much, young man. Thank you. I've seen um, a high vote for this question. Okay, let me, let me, you have 13 votes for this question. It seems that there is much focus on racial harmony, but not religious harmony. Is religion not as important? So my take is, you know, when we discuss things about Singapore, we know that we are multiracial and multireligious. As much as we want to focus on racial uh, harmony, in fact, without realizing it, we also know that we are doing the same thing for religious harmony. It's about wanting to respect each other, understanding each other's beliefs, and also ensuring that we know more about each other. So there's no difference about 
whether we are focusing on racial or religious harmony. In fact, it is as important, and I think um, maybe the panelists would, could also maybe add I'll just share things. as a um, from my own personal experience as a member of parliament on the ground. There are various things I have to deal with. You know, drains that choke, and got mosquito, I got cats, all sorts of stuff. But one of the things that we typically deal with uh, revolves sometimes around the aspect of religion and I guess race to some degree. For example, those people who live, who live near a church, uh, some of them might be very unhappy. Sundays, there are a lot of cars they have to park. Or who live near a mosque, Fridays, they have because of parking and Friday prayers. Or those who live near a temple will be complaining, hey, why are they always burning you know, incense and everything and then the ashes go in the air? The fact is, we live in a society where it's multiracial, it's multi-religious. And some of these practices have been there for a long time. But some things at which I think in the past, people were just very tolerant because that's part and parcel of growing up. But today, you do find some level of tolerance going down. People are becoming a bit more self-centered. Some, majority, I think, are fine. There'll be individuals who play up those issues. But that's something I ask you to think about as well. Those of you who live in the HDB flats, in, you know, in the estate, you will encounter this. Funer funerals in the void deck, um, weddings in the void deck, uh, burning of incense, prayers, uh, being uh, broadcasted. I think all this add to who we are as a people, and we embrace it. But there will be individuals, unfortunately, and there will always be that, people who are, for whatever reason, less tolerant. And again, I put it to you is, how do you respond to that? How do you make a stand in something that you believe in, and maybe even at home? Because sometimes some of our parents, grandparents may not be very tolerant. But if all of us begin to do our part, I think we also begin to create a common space for us to give and take. And I think that's, that's something that I would like to emphasize, because I do see some elements of that, but it doesn't mean that we are, you know, the situation is bad in Singapore, but it's something that reminds you, you have to constantly work at it. You know, the research that we did with IPS, it's not just about race, it's also about religion. Maybe Dr. Matthews, you, you would like to say something about this? You know, when we looked at the same issues about race and religion, we realized that to some extent there is that uh, little gap. It will take a little bit more time for us to bridge some of our religious differences because I think religious differences go into the core of who we are as individuals, as people. So, for instance, in some of the findings, I think we have, uh, there's no problem. Everybody's very comfortable marrying across racial groups, I mean, a lot more now, I think about, there's a slightly higher percentage, maybe 60%. Uh, when it comes to religious groups, it drops down to maybe like 30%, something like that. So it kind of gives you an idea that religion and, and religious differences continue to be an important part of what marks us. In the past, uh, when we think about Singapore, we think about Chinese, are generally Buddhists or some kind of Taoists who believe in some kind of ancestral worship, M Malays are Muslim, Indians are Hindu, uh, if they are in the other category, Eurasian, the Christian. Today, I think there's a lot more, there's, there's mixtures. And, and so, of course, the sites for tension increase. So over the years, I'm sure we have to think about both uh, race and religion. Very often, it comes together. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, there definitely is a part that uh, it still is not there. Uh, we have this item on our survey. We ask about how much are we willing to find out or share or know about other people's religious beliefs. Uh, to appreciate it, the number goes on a little bit more, I mean, a little down, compared to racial beliefs. So it, it tells something that there's a little bit more growth that needs to be there in terms of us appreciating other people's religion. So the, the points made by Minister and also Matthew, Dr. Matthews, actually we do think that both racial and religious harmony are important. There's no difference, there's no clear one focus and we just want to assure you that it is as important and we will do all that we could as, as a, an organisation. And also I think what Minister is trying to say, you as an individual, we need also to understand more so that wherever we live, whatever differences that we see, it doesn't get amplified, rather for us to be able to appreciate and understand each other better. Okay, can we have the next one? Okay, there are two of you. It's okay, both of you can go to the mics. Ah, see the first one. Go, Young go, lady, go. Please. <laughs> okay, you go first. Introduce yourself first, please.
Can you repeat that again? <laughs> it sounded really controversial. That's why we're all excited over here. Just to be clear. Minister, you are. Well, Singapore is a secular country, meaning that we are not a religious state, right? Um, but I think my point is that race, religion, is something that's well primordial. I think it's very much part of who we are, and we believe, and certainly I believe, that there's no point pretending that we are colorblind. There's no point pretending that these things don't matter. These things are part of who we are, and we should learn to embrace it. But paying attention to it, working hard at it, doesn't mean that we are there. It just means that we realize the nature of the dynamics of religion and race and the impact it can have. And because we cherish it and we cherish that common space, that's why we continue to work at it. Whether you're a secular state, whether we think that amongst many countries we are actually very uh, tolerant and very harmonious from a religious and racial perspective, but I think it would be a mistake the moment we think that we are there and therefore let's ease back and let's be more colorblind, let's, you know, not, let's ignore all this. Because some people, I will tell you that I've had conversations with fairly senior Singaporeans and some of them feel, look, let's move on. Why are we still talking about racial harmony, religious harmony? We are matured enough. Some of us may be matured enough to discuss some of these topics in a sensitive manner. Some of you who have visited ISD will know that there are undercurrents that exist. So I think it's important for us to continue to work at it. Not because we're not confident in ourselves, but because we believe that it's precious, we understand the nature of it, and we constantly want to work at it to make sure that we maintain and continue to build on what we have here. And just added on to that, um, I'll tackle the big elephant in the room. I mean, I wrote a book about returning to Singapore after five years away, and then it was turned into a TV series. Singapore, as you all know, is evolving and changing at such a rapid rate possibly unprecedented anywhere else in the developed world. The Singapore I left in 2006 was a completely transformed landscape when I returned in 2011, five years later. I don't think there's any country in the world that had changed so rapidly in five years. And of course, we can't be naive. Of course, it impinges upon uh, racial, religious, social harmony. We have got, I'm not going to argue about the figures, but we have a, a huge influx of foreigners now in this country that contributes to Singapore society that we didn't have five years ago, right? Now, at this moment in time, and I'm only going to give my own anecdotal evidence, um, Mandarin is increasing in Singapore. And that's a good thing. I got my daughter learning Mandarin because I'm a very kiasu parent, right? So, I've got nothing against Mandarin. But when I came back to Singapore, after five years away, that was the first discernible difference I recognized in Singapore. Mandarin is everywhere. Everywhere. Like never before. And that's great. It's a 21st century language, right? But when I go to giant supermarket, I do something I never did before. I look along the counters and I think, no, nope, Mandarin, 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 uh, Tagalog, Mandarin, Tagalog, <laughs> Mandarin, Tagalog, ah, English. And I go to that one, right? Because if I don't, I'm going to go to this counter and we're not going to be able to communicate, right? I'm going to say, I'm going to say something like, excuse me, uh, do you know where the toilet roll is? And the only reply I'm going to get is, got passion card? <laughs> and no, no, no. Do you know where the toilet roll is? Got passion card? <laughs> Can I use credit card? Got passion card? <laughs> you got beautiful eyes. Got passion card? I love you. Got passion card? <laughs> right? So Singapore has changed. We can bury our head in the sand as much as we like, but Singapore has changed. And I'm not going to sound like the PAP, but English has always been our working language. And I'm not going to get all Somerset Mall and be some sort of cultural imperialist and say, you must learn my language because it's superior. No, it's because it was the language that united us all, whether we were Chinese, Malay, Eurasian, or the others. I'm from the racial group known as the others. When you fill in the form, I have to tick the box that says the others. It sounds like a movie. Singapore was invaded by the others. They are everywhere, taking all the jobs. They are known as the others. 
Got passion card. So, <laughs> so, but there's a very, very serious team point that I'm trying to make here, but I use humor to cunningly disguise it. And that is, if, we don't, if we're not paranoid about racial uh, and religious harmony, then these things can easily escalate over time. And it's very easy, and I'm going to say it, it's very easy for the majority race in this country, which is now China, which of course is Chinese, which has now been supplemented by a huge influx of people from China, which is great, for that Mandarin-centric culture, shall we say, to dominate. And that will not inconvenience me so much, but it will inconvenience all the Singaporean Indians, the Singaporean Eurasians, the Singapore Paranakans, the Singaporean Malays, and that's not good because English is what unifies us. So we have to be on our guard for these subtle and sometimes not so subtle changes, the dramatic social economic changes that have happened in Singapore in the last five years. So we, I agree with the minister. We shouldn't take it for granted because Singapore is not the same place it was five years ago and will probably not be the same place five years from now. So we have to be on our guard. And no, I don't have a passion card. There you go. Thank you. Add, since the point was raised, I think it's important for us to understand. For example, I first encountered this same experience, although I speak Mandarin, when I was car four buying bicycle for my well, car four has closed down, but uh, not because of this incident. But uh, <laughs> but I wanted to buy a bicycle, and then I spoke to the the sales lady, and she asked me whether I could speak Mandarin. Obviously, she doesn't speak English. What had changed? I think which new notice, and that's exactly the period where the changes happened where I think we were grappling with some of the economic issues and we opened up the space. Why, for example, today you see, you hear a lot more Mandarin being spoken, because we never had, we never had in the services, retail, uh, foreign workers from China working in that sector, but we changed that. We opened up that space, so that allowed a growth of some of the retail, the commercial space, which I think there are some benefits. But as with all changes, when it happens too fast, too sudden, society doesn't adapt and adjust to it and we have a reaction, which is where we are today. And which is why it's important for us to be careful. I think we realised that, I think sometime in the 08, 09 period, the government realised that, I think that's, that's causing an issue, that short space of that three, four years or so where we open up, it has crossed a bit of a social threshold, which is why we are tightening up and trying to ratchet it back. But, so we understand that, as with all things, you realise in a country where you think, being majority Chinese, right, and you would, and it's not just the non-Chinese who are having a reaction. It's Singaporean Chinese who are also being uncomfortable with people coming from the People's Republic of China who are working here. So it shows that even within your own racial group, you have biases that in which you regard others. So the point here is, I think at all times, let's not be naive. It's not a reflection of a lack of confidence in our maturity. It's an acknowledgement of human nature being what it is, but continue to work at it. Structurally, as a government, we have to watch the structures. So processes, policies, we will have make the adjustments. But as people, we have a choice in the way we behave. We have a choice in the way we regard others. We may not like it, but we can still determine the way we talk about it. We can still determine whether we treat people with dignity and respect. Remember the pictures that you drew about treating people with kindness? wanting to be treated with respect, that's something all of us can do, regardless of how we feel about a situation. There is no excuse for poor behaviour, there's no excuse for us to be racist, there's no excuse for us to be intolerant. But that's completely within our control. Fine. <clears throat> so, even though we are a secular nation, there's no reason, that's not a reason for us to stop focusing on, on this. It's important. So important and critical. Yes, young lady. Mm, okay. Racism online. So can I, can I throw back this question to you first? What, what do you think of of those things that's happening online. Are you comfortable with it? Uh, do you say something about it? Yeah. Uh, 
Yes. Yes. Okay. You don't like it. Okay, so hold, hold that thought. You don't like it, right? So can I ask some of the Malay students here, do you hear about this Amy Chong's posting and how do you feel about it? Can I, do you feel offended? May I see uh, hands raised for, among the Malay students? Just, 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 just be, be honest about it. Okay. So you, you're not alone, okay? You don't, you don't have to feel bad about it. You're not alone. But what is important to me is about how you react, okay? How you react. As somebody who may be uh, violent or somebody who is angry and translate this uh, reaction to something uh, worse, saying bad things about Amy, scolding Amy's family, Scolding Amy's race, that is to me a negative reaction. Or even worse, going on the street and protest and attacking somebody of Amy's race, for example. That's the reaction that we hope we all Singaporeans should not have, right? Even though when you see such really silly, offensive, or even sometimes you don't even understand why they post such things. But as a person, you can react positively, you can advise, you can point, like what minister says, this is wrong, or what Neil said, this is wrong, but we need to all play a role, play a part in doing this. So this is my take. So I would like to hear from you, because you asked us the question, I think it was worthwhile for us to hear from you as a young person, how do you feel? And I, I, I can understand totally that you feel offended, but you did not react violently, right? You didn't post anything bad about Amy, you didn't scold her race or religion or whatever it is, right? So that's very positive. But you hope that all of us will try and make things better. Okay, maybe now I can open it up to the other panelists, uh, Minister. What I thought was also encouraging wasn't that, um, that the Malay community felt offended. Yeah. Many Singaporeans felt offended. I felt offended when I read, I was like, what is this woman on? I mean, Malay weddings happen all the time, just as Chinese will be burning their incense, and then, the, you know, uh, Sunday at church, people will be, there will be churchgoers that will need to park in the car. So the point is, there will always be individuals who will make stupid comments like that about race, about religion. And I would suggest, let us not stop at race and religion. And I think this issue on the online conversation is something that worries me. Let's talk about nationality. Let's talk about actually just being downright hateful, abusive against others just because, not just because of different race, not just because of different religion, different nationality, but different beliefs and so on. We can disagree, we can be critical, we can argue, but there is no excuse for poor behaviour. But that unfortunately is what is happening online. And my concern as a parent, right? My daughter is like three now, my son is P5. My worry is that today, many of you are online. I'm not sure how many of our parents are there guiding us. And those of you here who are parents, how many of us are there guiding our children? But it's quite unprecedented, I think, in the history of mankind, where people grow up at a very young age, receiving very unfiltered influences from what, as Neil said, for many, oh, this is a freedom of speech. Everyone should be entitled to. Well, I think we all ought to be guided in our own ways, develop our values, and then decide. So whether it's race, religion, nationality, different views, I think we need to be careful because online behaviour encourages and allows us, to, and I suspect some of you might be there as well, maybe not in your real identity, but in your avatars, playing a certain role, and you enjoy it tearing people down. It basically breeds a society which is hateful and angry. That's not who we are. I do not believe that that's the kind of society we want to be. I do not believe that most Singaporeans are like that. But again, we need to make a stand. So when incidents like this happen, make a stand. But how you make that stand becomes important. Don't respond hate with hate. Don't respond anger with anger. I think and that's where I think we can truly build a nation that's very different from others where we do value and we do respect others despite our differences. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I, I think that 
one of the concerns I have with online media is that it, it lends itself to cowardice. And I think we're better than that. I just think it lends itself to cowardly bullying. Anyone can point fingers online. Anyone can abuse online because there's a wall there. You're kind of hidden. You know, there is a blog out there, and I'm not making this up. You can Google it later, which has the, the, the title heading, Why Neil Humphreys Must Die. Right? Me. That's me. Why Neil Humphreys Must Die. Right? And it's got this long blog written by another unmore frustrated writer who's very upset he can't get his work published. So he writes, Why Neil Humphreys Must Die. And he's trying to be funny. It's about as funny as a headache, but he's trying to be funny. So in that situation, what do I do? Do I respond to the guy? No, I sink to his level. So I, I, I just let it go because what, what can I possibly gain from that? You know, trading hateful barbs online. I'm going to be the bigger person. So I let it go. Unfortunately, my sister went online and attacked him, but that's a different story altogether. <laughs> I told her not to, but anyway, that's a different story. But the point I'm making is, so, but he's a coward. To do that, he's a coward. I bet if he's in this forum right now, he'd sit there quietly at the back and not say a word. But go online, and he can attack and attack and attack. So I'm very uncomfortable with the cowardly bullying aspect of it. We're better than that. We don't need to hide in the shadows behind aliases and pseudonyms and just attack races, nationalities, and all the things that the ministers mentioned. I make fun, I poke fun, I satirize, I ridicule, but my name's there. My face is literally there on my books. I can't hide. So anything I say, I am accountable. And that's the key word. I can't say anything without backing it up because I'm accountable. And I feel that that's the concern on cyberspace for me. It's my journalistic instincts. We're not accountable and we can be very cowardly. And I personally believe that you guys are just much better than that. I really do believe that. Thank you. Now we are, my apologies, we are a bit short of time. So I would like the two of you to ask your question or share your views. Combine, okay? That will be the last for today. If you don't mind, introduce yourself, please. I'm Isabella, and I'm Shivani, and we're from Anti-Asian Racism Racism in children's generation is steadily getting worse. What can children do in an after school to combat this problem? Also, young children under the age of five, what can they do if a racist comment is passed to them at such a young age? I'm just curious. That's a big statement you made. Not I'm saying it's wrong, but have you, have you heard of this or is there evidence of this? Because I'm, very, I'm very concerned by that statement. You've experienced it yourself? Oh, right, okay. Among the young. And they were a victim of racism. At that age, five. <laughs> what a lull. <laughs> uh, um, Well, it, it comes full circle, I'll be brief, it comes full circle to the point I made at the beginning, or, or, or very near to the beginning, you know, unfortunately, you can't, you can't choose your parents sometimes, and you can't choose your families sometimes, and I can only assume that, at, and again, I'm making the assumption, at that age, it must be something that has been passed down, unfortunately, from, a, from, a, from a, a caregiver, a helper, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, or whatever, and you would hope, and I would hope, that in an enlightened society like Singapore, again, coming back to my earlier point, education, 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 with seminars like this, and in the classroom, and in the workplace later on, you would hope, you would hope, would correct that. But you can't choose your parents sometimes, unfortunately. So experiences like this will happen, and I think all of us will experience in some shape and form. So how do you deal with it? So I would say this, I mean, Coming back to the point I made earlier, it's personal responsibility. I think all of us have the capacity to make our own decisions. We have the capacity to do the right things. And we know that we have a conscience, whatever our faith, whatever our religion might be, I think we do know what is right and what is wrong. And I think you should listen to that conscience and to behave the moment you begin to become aware of it. Parents do a job. I think we need to be there to guide our children and to guide them not just by what we say, importantly, what we do, what, how we behave uh, when we're driving and someone horns and the way you, you curse the other guy. All these little things, which some of us are still guilty of, but all these little things actually affect because children are just absorbing. And, but the thing is, what can we do as individuals? That's one. As a system, 
schools, I think at least, uh, and organizations, I want people, sessions like this, we can continue to do as much as we can, but ultimately, you cannot mandate. You cannot say that, you cannot order people to behave in particular ways. We must make those choices and never forget that. Never devolve personal responsibility and say that, well, it's not my fault, it's the other person's fault. Someone in society, the school never taught us. The fact is, nobody puts, puts a gun to our head in the way we behave. Remember that you have the choice. And if all of us here talk so much and feel so much about the importance of racial harmony, religious harmony, treating each other with love, kindness, respect, and if all of us here step out of this room and begin to treat people that way and make it a point to do that, and not just ourselves, but to encourage the people around us to do the same, society will change. I believe that. So never underestimate the difference that each and every one of us can make in this realm and beyond. I, I just want to echo that. I mean, every day I, I sit down with my children, I tell them to give me a little spill of what goes on in school. And so, invariably, over some time, you'll hear some of the discussion is going to be some of the racist things which have happened or, or the things which have harmed religious tolerance. My kids are highly attuned to some of those things. I didn't teach them that. Uh, but it was very interesting that very often when they share about that, I always ask them, what do their teachers say about some of these things? And I'm glad that many times when there are ideas which are not too correct, uh, schools play a big role and try to intervene and give positive ideas. So I think that's one very, very powerful thing. Uh, certainly, I think for all of us who I mean, especially if you happen to be the recipient of a racist comment. Uh, growing up, I, I received a lot of that. Uh, and I think a lot of people, I mean, it, it, sometimes not uh, ill intention, uh, not because people wanted to be just downright evil and unkind. Some people just don't know any better. So they think, well, this is fun, saying that kind of very racist thing. But I think it's how we respond to. Uh, we choose to say, hey, you know what I mean? It's okay, we don't have to treat other people in an evil, wild way because they've been racist to us. Then I think it begins to give a positive vibe and people begin to realize, hey, no point trying to bully them. So I, I think how we respond and how we also show that we are comfortable in ourselves. Somebody might look at us and demean us and say, hey, I mean, the color is not right or whatever. But if we have a healthy respect for ourselves, I think people will get the message and they'll show us some respect. Thank you, everyone. Is that okay, young lady? Thank you. You all have been a wonderful audience, and uh, for those who have asked questions and shared their views, why don't we give them a round of applause? Come on. It has been a long day. I know that from uh, early in the morning, we had the sharing with Dr. Matthews and I even said a few things in my speech and now we have the opportunity to share with uh, Minister Neil Humphreys and Dr. Matthews again and I think we have all benefited from today's discussion. I know you all had a wonderful discussion among yourselves during the breakout session and with that, I would like you to say thank you to Minister for gracing this occasion here today. And our panelists, Neil Humphreys and Dr. Matthews. So before we end, I just would like to remind you again, you are the future of Singapore, the next generation of people who will bring Singapore further. We all have responsibilities. I know that you all are still young, but nevertheless, it's never too early to start, learn, acquire knowledge as much as possible, know about each other better, your fellow Singaporeans, so that all of you can be the flag bearer of Singapore's harmony, the people who will make sure that we continue to grow as a country and a stable country. Thank you very much.